Good morning once again, and thank you for joining us this week, and I hope you're doing well. We're into another month, which is hard to believe that it's been over a month since we've been together last, but I do hope you're doing well. As always, I just want to encourage you that if any of you have anything that you're in need of or just need someone to talk to, I'm always happy to, uh, to talk to you, and I know as a church we're a very loving community who wants to support and, and love on one another. I'd also like to encourage you, if you haven't done this, reach out to somebody from the church who maybe you haven't talked to in a few weeks. Uh, I think it's a good thing to to stay connected and be proactive about that. I was thinking this week about some of us who have different ministries that we serve in, either within the church or within the community, and just thinking of how hard this time must be for for all of you as well, um, to not be able to participate the way that you're used to. And um, that's just one example of the many Uh, ways how this is a really challenging time for us all. But again, continuing to pray for our church, for our community. And in fact, would you join me in a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we continue to praise you for your goodness, Lord, that even though we don't see the, uh, the purposes in your sovereign will, Lord, we trust that you are working your purposes for good because you are good. Lord, I continue to pray for our church in this time apart. I continue to pray for our community, Lord. I pray for the the health and safety of those both within our church, but with everyone within Sista Park and Rankin and our locally surrounding communities, Lord. I pray for their health. Continue to pray for our community leaders, Lord, um, and pray for our state and and national leaders as well, Lord, for, for wisdom on their part, Lord. And we do pray and ask you that very soon we're able to be together and to worship again. In Jesus' name, amen. Decided to call a little bit of an audible last week. We're going through the Gospel of John. I actually decided today to take a bit of a break from John. Um, And this week, we're actually going to be looking at a passage from the beginning of the book of Habakkuk. Um, Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you, violence, and he will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on, guilty men whose own mind is their God. So with everything going on in our community, in our state, in our nation, and around the world, this week I wanted to talk about a prevalent biblical topic that I think is often overlooked in the modern American church. Lament. As we just read, we're in the book of Habakkuk. Just a little bit of background on this book briefly. Habakkuk is a prophet in the Old Testament. The book is written in the early 6th century BC, most likely under the reign of a king named Jehoiakim. At this time, Babylon was really becoming a major threat in the region. They had conquered Nineveh, Assyria, and Egypt. Along with the threat of the Babylonians, as is a common theme throughout Israel's history, the Israelites also faced internal threats tied to their own idolatry and covetousness and faithlessness. What's more, their king, Jehoiakim, was not a good king. He spent lavishly on projects. He enslaved people and was just generally an oppressive ruler. I mentioned that Habakkuk was a prophet. 
Now, generally in prophetic books of the Bible, it's a message from God to the people. But in Habakkuk, the prophet himself asks God the questions about the events of his day, and the Lord responds. Habakkuk is a commentary on the time in which he was living, and he laments to God about the situation, as well as lamenting to God about the injustice that existed in Israel. Lament is not whining. It's not complaining. It's not grumbling. Lament is an expression of grief and sorrow. And lament is very common in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. We see it here in the book of Habakkuk. We see it as a theme throughout the prophetic books. And the Bible has more books of prophecy than any other genre. We see it in places like Job, Ruth, and Ecclesiastes. In the Psalms, lament is the theme of more Psalms than any other subject. We constantly see themes of grief, sorrow, and anguish in the Psalms. And that is the hymnal of the Old Testament. We also see lament in the book of Lamentations. The Bible literally has a book named after Lament, which was written not too long after the book of Habakkuk. We also see elements of Lament in the New Testament. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we, he said that referring to mourning sin, both our own sin and the sin that is in our world. Jesus laments in the garden before he's crucified, before he's captured, when he asks God, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And so here as well in the book of Habakkuk, we see lament. Habakkuk voices concerns to the Lord for what he sees in his society. Verse 2, he says, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? O oh Lord, how long? That's a refrain that's used several times in the Old Testament. Oftentimes, that is said out of lament over God seeming distant or seeming to forget his promises, or when people feel like he's letting the wicked go unpunished. In Psalm 13, using the same Hebrew word translated as how long, it says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? O Lord, how long? The word how long in Hebrew can mean how long, referring to a duration of time, but it can also mean where especially when asking, where are you? And I think that enhances the cry that Habakkuk makes. He's expressing deep hurt. Habakkuk wants God to act. The prophet has been long suffering, and yet he still hasn't seen any resolution. How long, O Lord? And we continue in verse 2. We see the prophet's comments on the sin of his society. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. Habakkuk asks God why he makes him have to look upon such evil. God sees the same things Habakkuk sees. How can the Lord tolerate it? Iniquity, wrong, destruction, violence, strife. Why, God? In verse 4, Habakkuk continues his lament. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. The law, God's law for how his people are con to conduct their lives, Habakkuk says is paralyzed. The Israelites have not been faithful. God's law is a good thing, but it is not being consistently and faithfully practiced in the land. And I think of all those things that Habakkuk had to lament, but I also think that there are many things for us to lament in our own society. Right now we have this virus that's impacting our community, our nation, our world, life turned upside down, sickness and death. Over 60,000 people have died from this just in America. 
people losing jobs and businesses. We see people suffering in isolation or apart from family and friends. How long, O Lord? We see violent acts of terrorism, parts of the country run by dictators, unborn babies aborted by the hundreds of thousands in America, the worldwide issue of human trafficking, the decay of the family. How long, O Lord? There are all sorts of evils that people do. People who cheat to win, cheat to get rich, people who commit crimes and never get caught. There are people who treat those around them terribly, people who are physically abusive, emotionally abusive. How long, O Lord? There's so much darkness in our world. There's so much that happens that's not as it should be. O Lord, how long? As I've already said, for Habakkuk, Part of his focus is on the community around him, the Israelites, the people of God. And we too have things to lament within the church, both in America and the church around the world. There are people in churches who are deeply wounded, deeply wounded by others trying to get power, trying to get influence, deeply wounded by gossip or lies, deeply wounded by manipulation or control. Without a doubt, There are many positives of the church being the church, people serving and helping and loving one another. But sadly, there are also times when the family of God does harm to its own. It's not supposed to be that way. So many people who stray away from church because they've been hurt, because they've had their heart broken, because they've felt betrayed. Oh Lord, how long? Grievous sins in society and in the churches, and the things that people can do to cause pain. They can cause pain to those they know or to groups that they care about. Oh Lord, how long? We must be healthy with our emotions when we're in pain, when we're sad and saddened by what we see. As Habakkuk laments, lament is healthy. Like I said in the beginning, the fact that Habakkuk is lamenting is not a sin. With the times where people lament in the Bible, God never rebukes their their lamentation. The heart that cries, how long, O Lord, is never criticized for asking. Lament matters. And the dialogue of our hearts with God, we must always be honest with how we feel. Specifically to this passage, it deals with what we see in the world. But lament also applies to struggles that we face, times where we feel lonely or betrayed, times where we have poor health. We can lament our hardships that we face. We can lament our own sins. And we can lament the struggles that we see others going through. God knows the thoughts of our heart. There are difficult things we face. There are struggles we face. There are situations and things that happen to us that are crushing to us. And in those moments, we need to be honest with God. We need to be honest about the hurt that we feel, about the distressing nature of sin and suffering. We need to be honest with God about the struggles we're experiencing. We need to be honest about the harshness we see in the world around us. Here in Sista Park, where so many of us come from a German background and heritage. And I love and am proud of my German ancestry. Not exactly known for being the most touchy-feely, emotional people on earth. It's a generalization. But I think for a lot of us, the temptation can be to, to keep a stiff upper lip, to remain stoic, to give an outward appearance that everything is fine. I think we can be tempted to always want to appear strong. But the problem with that is that it doesn't make you weak to hurt, to lament. It makes you human. It doesn't make you weak to grieve. Saying that you're not grieving when you're in grief doesn't make the grief magically go away. In fact, it's bad for your physical and mental health. Studies show that links to poor emotional management cause stress, anxiety, depression, high blood pressure, sleeplessness. It can increase the risk of heart disease. 
but it's also bad, more importantly, for our spiritual health. Because our lives are not always sunshine and victory. You can try to bury your emotions. But as we learned in the classic tale by Edgar Allan Poe, The Telltale Heart, just because you try to bury something, it doesn't mean that it won't still cause issues for you. Part of the issue is that we tend to look at emotions as being good or bad. Joy is a good emotion. Grief is a bad one. We want joy, not grief. So when we're grieved, it can be tempting to want to ignore it or to bury it. Gratitude is a good emotion. Anguish is bad. Wonder, pleasure, and courage are good emotions. Fear and shame are bad. We judge ourselves when we feel these things. We're not supposed to feel negative emotions, we tell ourselves. So we put up a front. But not dealing with the emotions that we don't want still causes issues, which I think in the long run robs us of joy. If we never deal with grief or sorrow or sadness, it still comes up. And I think it continues to ripple throughout the rest of our lives, through the various aspects of our lives. Susan David, who's a psychologist and psychology professor at Harvard, refers to this as the tyranny of positivity. The tyranny of positivity. For Christians, I think that there can be an added pressure for us to always want to seem put together and happy. I'll use an illustration from the Christian music that plays on the radio. The Psalms in the Bible are the hymnal. And again, there are more psalms about lament than any other subject. Yet, it's basically unheard of in contemporary Christian music. They're much more likely to be songs about celebration and victory. But lament is necessary for our well-being, because we are emotional beings. And a healthy means of working through all emotions is talking to God expressing joy and gratitude to God, but but also lamenting to God in our times of suffering and difficulty. We have to have our feelings. We have to feel our feelings. If you have the flu and don't make any changes, you don't take any time off work, you don't keep yourself hydrated, you don't get any extra rest, you're still eating like chili cheese dogs, putting them in mayonnaise, Just because you don't acknowledge that you're sick doesn't make the illness go away. Just because you don't acknowledge sorrow, it doesn't mean that you're not sorrowful. We can pretend we're fine when we're not. You can tell a person, I'm fine when you're not. But we need to be honest with God about how we're feeling. Again, he already knows. He's God. And you're not going to fool him. I think that's one of the great things we see in Bible passages which deal with lament and openness with God. One of the best examples I can think of is Psalm 69. We see the raw emotion from David. He says, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. What I did not, what I did not steal must I now restore. O oh God, you know my folly. The wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. David says he feels like he's drowning in his affliction. We don't even actually know specifically what he's referring to in this psalm, but we can appreciate and empathize with the extreme distress and anguish through which he's going. It's okay to feel that way sometimes. And we see that from Habakkuk in our passage this morning. God You see what is happening in the world. People mock your name. They dishonor you and your people. 
How long, O Lord? How do you deal with lament? Do you feel your feelings? Do you go to God? Or are you a stoic? Do you actually judge yourself for sometimes feeling bad? With lament, it's important to consider our thoughts in the light of Scripture. We need to lament based on reality. That God is good, but that the world has fallen. How a good God allows a bad world to exist is an honest question. Habakkuk isn't just haphazardly ranting against God. He knows how good God is and how bad the world is, how bad people are. Lament is based in truth. It's an honest dialogue with you and your heavenly Father who loves you. Lord willing, we'll talk sometime about the grumbling that the Israelites did when they were in the desert in the book of Exodus. And at one point in their wanderings, the Israelites actually accuse God of bringing them out of Egypt just so that he could kill them in the desert. That is not lament. That's grumbling. Lament is done in the light of the truth of who God is. Grumbling is an attack against a caricature that is not accurate to who God is. Again, lament is worshipful. I even say that lament can be joyful. That in lament there can be rejoicing and meditation on the character of God, the goodness of God, and the love of God. Joy is not always just about jumping up and down in happiness. Lament is something that takes a high view of God because it assumes he's listening, which he is. Lament is not turning from God, it's focusing on God. Lament has a high view of God because it looks at the evil and suffering in the world, but compared to God's perfection and righteousness. We must remember that God does not like sin either. In fact, he hates it. He hates it more than any of us do. He hates it with a perfect and righteous opposition. And in our section in verse 5, God responds to Habakkuk. Habakkuk is commenting on the evil that is in the world. He's not wrong in his observation. God responds in verse 5, Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. Again, Habakkuk is not rebuked for his questions, but what a powerful word the Lord gives him. The NIV Study Bible has a good description where it says that Habakkuk needed to broaden his horizons. God pulls back the curtain and he gives the prophet Habakkuk more insight into his plans for Israel with all of their sins. Verse 6, For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation. When he says the Chaldeans, the Chaldeans became the Babylonians. And God says that he is raising them up. He's foretelling what they're going to do. He says in the, in the passage, Who march through the breadth of the earth to seize, seize dwellings not their own? The Babylonians. These people were not righteous either. But that's who God is going to use. Verse 7 continues to describe the Babylonians. They're, they are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Verse 8 begins to use metaphors to describe the size of the Babylonian army. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the, the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. Describing the might of the Babylonian army. Again, this is God saying what he's going to do to befall his own people, the Israelites. Verses 10 and 11. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. God's response to Habakkuk 
is that sin will not go unpunished, even the sins of Israel, that there will be judgment, that there will be a day of reckoning. That happened in the following generation of Habakkuk's time in 586 BC when the Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom. As Habakkuk laments sin, this passage is a reminder that God is a just God. No one pulls a fast one on the Lord. We need to pray for people who aren't walking with God, but for those who mock the Lord, who don't repent, justice is coming. It might not always be on the timeline we prefer. It might not always be in a person's own lifetime, but justice is coming. God is at work. It's so easy to have a narrow view of history and time, to focus just on what's going on in front of us, to focus just on the here and the now. But God has eternal purposes in his plans. That's certainly something that we see in the Bible. In Genesis, when God makes a promise to Abraham, God tells him that his people will be enslaved in a land that is not their own for 400 years. That was not good in itself, but God used it for his good and for his purposes. God used that to set the stage for the most dramatic event to happen to his people in the Old Testament when he redeemed Israel from slavery. God used that event to show his power and dominion over the nations of the world. And that is a theme that we see throughout the Bible. And it is true today that God is sovereign over his creation. He is sovereign over over the universe, the stars and the sky, the vast galaxies, and he is sovereign over the nations of the world. The nations sin and people sin. There's disobedience and rebellion. Nevertheless, God is using all of that for his purposes. He uses the great empires like pawns in his own personal chess game. God takes the various strains of humanity and the nations and weaves them together into his grand tapestry. He works his plans on an eternal scale. All of the evils that we see around us in the world, all of it will be used to work for God's own glory, either through his grace and redemption and forgiveness or for his righteous justice in judging a person's sin. God worked through the nations of the world to bring his people to the promised land. He worked through the nations of the world to bring his son into the world. When the Israelites sinned, sinned God used the nations to take the land. He continues to work through the nations of the world and will continue to do that until Christ returns. Even today, God is working things that we would not believe if told. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your goodness, Lord, in all things that you are working. And as we consider this situation, Lord, may we come to you in that same expectancy and hope and delight that you are good. Lord, may we be people who are open and transparent with you in the times of difficulty and struggle, to be honest with you, Lord. Things are difficult because the world has fallen. Lord, you are always good. May we continually remember that. And in the face of the difficulties we face, turn to you and trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.